I am Otmar Hindenhofer. I am professor for the economics of climate change and at the same time I am director of the Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change and the vice director of the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. My main role is that I am serving here as a convening lead author uh, for chapter 4 which is on economic growth, uh, welfare, human development. I would like to achieve basically two things. The first is I want to discuss this important subject with the best scholars around the globe, which is a huge privilege uh, to be part of this process. And secondly, it seems to me that now people become more and more aware that our societies around the globe are at the crossroads. So many people feel we cannot continue uh, the current economic growth model, you could say, in a much broader context. Some people feel the way of development which we have implemented in the last few decades can no longer uh, be continued. I'm not sure if this is true, but definitely I'm aware that this is a huge and a very profound discussion. And what we want to do in our chapter is we want first to gather the most empirical insights. The second thing is we want to clarify what kind of concepts might help us to understand what's going on. And the third level which I would like to achieve with my colleagues is to identify the most important narratives about the future of economic growth. Today we have already identified a few of these narratives and um, this seems to me is quite important because this could help people to find an orientation. It is not up to me to decide what is the appropriate narrative, what narrative is wrong or right, but at least to be aware that there are more than one narrative might help people to find the pathway into the future. One idea which is uh, very important that we have to understand that the atmosphere, the oceans, the forests have important properties of a global common. So the atmosphere is now used by humankind as a disposal space for our emissions. And meanwhile we realize that the limiting disposal space becomes more and more uh, important for us because of the uh, adverse effects of climate change. We are at risk of even dangerous climate change. And now the crucial question is, when this is true, how should we use in the future the limiting disposal space of the atmosphere? And I would say this has a lot to do with what's going on in our societies. It has a lot to do with the growth patterns, with the rising inequality in our societies. By and large, it is very, very complicated to implement any reasonable policy. What I have done so far is, in the last few years, I have to clarify basically two very simple questions. One question is, is economic growth feasible, even if we respect the limiting disposal space of the atmosphere? And in the end, is it desirable? The first question is more or less an empirical question, a factual statement. The second one about the desirability of economic growth is a profound ethical question. And uh, this is also where I contributed some aspects to this debate and I would say the feasibility and the desirability of economic growth as a core element of my research hopefully helps to shed some light on these open issues. If the atmosphere is perceived as a global common, which means that there's a limiting disposal space and we have quantified this very precisely, uh, if we want to limit the increase of global mean temperature around 2 degrees, we can release into the atmosphere 1,000 gigatons CO2. Given the current emissions rate, this means that this budget, this budget is exhausted within the next three decades. So we need a global agreement about the future use of this limiting disposal space. In Paris in December this year, we will discuss exactly this aspect and governments intend to come up with some kind of global agreement. However, I would say 
Paris might be another step, hopefully a successful step, but we need much more steps to come up with such an agreement which helps us to avoid uh, dangerous climate change. It's an institutional challenge and uh, the, the requirements for such a deal are un also unprecedented in human history. So in that sense I would say in Paris this year it's a little step, hopefully a little step, but much more steps are required and we have to understand much better under which conditions people are willing, prepared and able to cooperate at an international scale. This is something which is very, very difficult and hopefully we will get more insights about this issue. The issue of climate denial or climate contrarians is an interesting one because there are quite different people. One group of people denies that humankind is really responsible for the increase of global mean temperature or at least mainly responsible. So, this type of climate deniers have probably good economic interests, but they have science on their side. There is no doubt about this, because we are quite sure that because of the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation, uh, the uh, global mean temperature has been increased in the past since industrialization and will increase around 4 degrees. Uh, compared to pre-industrial level if we do not implement the climate policy. So that's quite clear. Um, the question, if we see now more consensus in the society, I would answer with a clear yes. So think about Pope Francis has released uh, two months ago a whole encyclical basically on climate change, poverty and inequality. And uh, this encyclical has been perceived very well around the world, around the globe. Many people uh, think now this uh, is something which could change the perception of climate change in Latin America, in America and, and, and also in Europe. So my understanding is that it definitely uh, these developments have helped to increase the consensus within our societies. But we should be aware that the way to transform our societies is an extremely long way and I would like to just, just give you one number. If we want to um, limit the increase of global mean temperature around 2 degrees in order to avoid dangerous climate change, almost 80% of coal has to remain underground and also oil and gas dependent on the technologies which we have available. Uh, one or two-thirds of gas and oil has to remain underground. The owners of oil and gas are not happy to do this and there are a lot of uh, uh, economic interests, vested interests here. And I think uh, this will take time to convince even these people to find a reasonable way, in reasonable instruments to implement climate policy. The answer is yes, there's an increasing consensus but there are also a lot of economic vested interests and we have to deal with that. I think the title of this panel also highlights some optimism because it says it's a panel on social progress, right? Progress means you have some hope that things can be improved and uh, things can become better. And in that sense I would say yes, there is definitely a potential for social progress around the globe and I'm quite optimistic we can do this. So I, I, I'm a strong believer in, in progress. I know that there are some uh, downsides of progress, social and technological progress, but by and large I, I think I'm optimistic and I believe in social and technological progress.